Welcome to On The Go with AAUW, the American Association of University Women. I'm your host, Jennifer DeSano, the Executive Director of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at George Mason University. And today on the program, we will be learning all about visual literacy with our guest, Dr. Heather McGuire from the Art History Department at George Mason University. Hi, Heather. Thanks so much for being on the program with us today. Hi, Jennifer. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> I'm excited because art is something I love. Obviously, everyone loves art. And what you're going to do with teaching us about visual literacy is take it to another level, explaining about how art is actually a mode of co communication. Before we get into that, though, I'd like to learn about you, Heather. And if you can tell me about your background, what's your fascination with art? How did you lead yourself towards this career in art history? OK, so I've been teaching art history at George Mason for the last two years. And I teach a survey class. And I also teach art since 1968. And I've been interested in art, I would say, since I was very young and had my first experience going to museums like it between 10 and 14 and got really excited about art. And I ended up studying actually at University of Virginia English literature. And as I got out of English literature, I realized that a lot of the models for literary criticism were the same as the models for art history. So my interest in art and literature led me to art history. And for the duration of my studies, I've been primarily interested in artists that are using images and text together. So I did my um, dissertation on a California artist named John Baldessari. Um, who uses language and texts and images. Yes, that's wonderful. And uh, so this interview is really going to be more like a lesson for me, for our audience, because we're going to look at a variety of images, which you're going to explain the relevance of and how they're connected to each other. Um, the first image we're going to look at is a vessel. Tell us about this vessel. OK, so visual literacy, I'm going to introduce everybody to visual literacy through thinking about how images functioned historically in cultures. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to, to uh, present a vessel, a Greek vessel. It's an amphora, which is a double-handled vessel. And you can see it on the image. And it features not just a functional object that can be used to carry grain or water, but also it has a storyboard on top of it. And these images oftentimes in ancient cultures, and even today, contain some of the most important aspects of the culture themselves, whether it be their myths, stories, legends, religious objects. And so what we're looking at here is a black figure wear vessel from 540 BC. And it features an image of Zeus and the myth about the birth of Athena. So Athena is legendarily have thought to have emerged as a fully formed human from the head of Zeus. He mm -hmm. was having a ter terrible headache. He had um, basically devoured his consort Metis, and Metis was pregnant with Athena. And when Zeus couldn't handle the headache anymore, he had Hephaestus, the blacksmith god, chop open his head with an ax, and out emerged Athena in full regalia. She's got a shield, a sword, and she's also wearing a helmet. So you'll notice that in terms of visual literacy, when you look at that amphora, the two main subjects that are featured in the story that are the most important are facing you, the viewer and the reader of the text. And you're deciphering the visual images. Zeus is represented in, as a mature subject in a full beard. You might recognize his attribute, which he's holding a lightning bolt in his hand. And then Athena's coming out of his head, and she's got her sword and spear. And then there are two additional figures on the sides that are each in profile. So that tells you as a reader that you're looking at the main subject there that is in larger scale and supposed to get your attention. And these are, these are objects that were made at a time when being able to read and write just weren't, weren't things that regular people could do. So they really relied on images to reinforce notions. Exactly. So we, that's true in talking about these myths, myths, Greek myths, which were then adopted and sometimes changed by the Romans. Even in the contemporary age, when you move into Christian iconography, we run into altarpieces. Like we see this double altarpiece. It's a diptych, which has two panels. And it represents eight scenes from the life of Jesus, primarily. And it's interesting because when these artists created these, they were put in um, churches as altarpieces in chapels or the main altar, where the public who might not be able to read the scriptures could actually see those stories in these episodes that they could decipher visually. So if you notice from, if we go into a detail shot, 
you notice in the top left-hand image you have the nativity, which some people might be familiar with. You see the largest figure, once again, the scale drawing your attention is the Virgin Mary. And then beneath her in the right-hand corner, you have the baby Jesus who is being bathed after he's been born. The scene, the setting is outdoors in a manger, kind of rocky outcropping. Okay, to the right of that, you have another episode from the life of Jesus that the public would be able to identify with, which is the Last Supper, where Jesus is surrounded by his 12 disciples in this meal that they share together outside of Jerusalem. You can see the city walls in the image. And then you'll notice that Jesus is almost like at the 10 to 11 o'clock position in the image. And then this is kind of the visual vocabulary of some of these narrative moments. He's oftentimes seated on one side by St. Peter, who's one of the oldest disciples. And on the other side, the figure that's kind of leaning on the table is St. John. And that's kind of a visual trope that repeats in some of these images of the Last Supper. That's interesting. And, and, and so we're looking at religious um, iconography. We're looking at images that are kind of ascribed to a certain culture. But you can do the same kind of um, uh, correlation between other cultures, so let's say Tibetan culture, and you have some examples of that? Right, so it's interesting because when you think about visual literacy, we oftentimes are reading visual texts through, which, through the images that we're familiar with. But I recently, last week, went to an exhibition at the Virginia Museum where they're showing Tibetan Buddhist images and paintings, and it's called Awaken, a Tibetan Buddhist Journey Towards Enlightenment. And actually, they had one of the painters, a contemporary painter of Tibetan imagery, that was doing a demonstration at the museum last week. And so I talked to him about his training because he was originally trained um, in this kind of imagery here, and his name is uh, Sharon Sherpa. And these are didactic visual texts from uh, Nepal and Tibet that are used to actually lead students. And a lama, a teacher, leads the students through the lessons these mandalas and then also sculptures help educate people in the practices and the iconography. In other words, the way the hands are positioned means one thing. Some of the symbols like the lotus flower and snakes might mean something else. So he, it's, even though he was trained for 20 years as a traditional painter, like we're gonna discuss now in visual literacy, he moved from these traditional formats into a much more contemporary um, mode of representation where he still has recognizable aspects and signs from those traditional images, but they've now been um, adapted and brought into a more contemporary visual language. So some of the things that we want to have the audience pay attention to are color schemes, and uh, this is a gold, this has some gold in it, um, and then also pictorials within within the uh, the portraits that we're going to see as we move along in this in this lesson that you're giving us. Yeah. Um, so going back to the Christian um, examples, and I know we have our next image is the um, uh, Blasco de Granin, the crucifixion. Right. And so, so that crucifixion image is painted in the Byzantine tradition, and you can see that it has this gold leaf background that is providing the entire framework for the central focus of that image, which is the crucified Jesus. And actually that might be one of the most familiar visual images that the public, if you're not Christian, that you might have seen in, um, in passing. And beneath the cross, you have the secondary figures, which many Christians might recognize as being Mary, Jesus's mother, who's oftentimes shown feigning. And then she's being captured sometimes by St. John. In this case, I think she's being captured by Mary Magdalene with St. John on the opposite side of the crucifix. But it's interesting because I asked um, Sharon Sherpa about the, um, this contemporary image and the fact that when I saw this, I read this through that more Western tradition of the religious icons with the gold background. And I said, do you have a problem with people who Ascribing aren't Ascribing their own yeah, yeah, their own tradition to the reading. And he said, no, actually, I like that as a point of entry. And it's one of the things that um, I'm opening up the tradition to readers who might not be familiar with the signs and symbols. And if you enter it that way, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's so, a great way to yeah. learn about what's trying to be communicated. And in the, um, in the crucifixion example, there are also things to pay attention to, such as the, the um, vines and things that are at the top of the gold in right, so that's a medieval image, and it's in, you can see that the perspective is not really resolved. In other words, it doesn't look like the space is going into deep space. It's some of the background, the out, rocky outcroppings are flat up against the crucifixion. The interesting thing about that is that one of the ways they frame your view is by putting these Gothic arches in a tendril-like format 
above the crucifix. And that is a kind of almost a de decorative and pattern detail that's from that period that we're gonna see contemporary artists adopting in a different way, specifically Kehinde Wiley as we talk about his work later in and the show. I, I think now we're gonna, we're gonna shift to a more modern, uh, or yes, are we doing the panels next, the di diptych panels? Um, we're gonna go into actually looking at the triple Oh, the Elvis. Warhol. Yeah, the okay. Warhol. So this next image is an Andy Warhol image. Uh, it's got Elvis, who's the biggest icon you can think of, other than, let's say, Jesus. Okay, so Jesus <laughs> is in the previous one. What's the, what's the connection there? So the connection is that Andy Warhol, it's interesting because it's late 20th century, and even though we still have altar, pace, altar pieces and religious icons, I think as a, a person who grew up in the Byzantine Catholic Church, he had seen icons regularly, but when he thought about American culture, he was moving into thinking about what are our secular icons, and so he brought in this image of Elvis that came off of um, one of the movies that he was in, Flaming Star, I think it is, mm -hmm. and it's a representation that he puts once again into a metallic framework, but instead of the gold leaf of the icon, he's placing it in the silver screen, like because it, Elvis is in a movie. This is still from a movie. So he takes an appropriated media image and then he silk screens it. So instead of, it's a different application of a visual language, it's something that can be repeated many times because once you make a silk screen, you can screen it several times and you notice that he's done it in a triple Elvis format here. Mm -hmm. So it's almost kind of giving you that sense of the amplification of celebrity in American culture. You don't just see it once, you see the person cycling through the media over and over and over. And we see that with tweeting and retweeting and Instagram and people, you know, re-forwarding images that they see in the media. So it's a, the, the image itself is a commentary on the culture that Warhol was experiencing at the time. Yeah, and he was fascinated with celebrities. And he, he had that saying that everybody would be famous for 15 minutes. And, and he also came out of a commercial art form because he was actually a commercial illustrator before he went into what we, we consider fine art. Mm -hmm. And so he took some of the processes from commercial Im, um, printing, like the silk screen, and brought it into a fine art context. Mm -hmm. so. And we're also familiar with the Marilyn Monroe images that he has done, the Campbell Soup images that he's done. But Marilyn Monroe, let's let's stick with her because there's some connection there as well with the religious motifs that we've already discussed. Exactly. So in the Museum of Modern Art Collection, they have a painting called um, the Gold Marilyn Monroe, and it's a religious icon format. Basically, she's a single panel, but she's centered in the middle of it, and it's a giant gold field surrounding her. It, her central image is also just her head, like a publicity headshot from a movie that she was in, Niagara, but he's actually added color to it, so he's accentuated kind of the color of the lips being red, blue eyeshadow, that platinum blonde hair. He's kind of amped it up in the way that these celebrities are kind of dolled up in order to then be put on screen, yeah. so. Well, and, and more than human, in a way. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we'll see, we see that portrait happening, and then, um, there, then we kind of are, we can even take that a step further into some portrait, portraiture that's been done recently of, uh, I, they're celebrities too, but political entities, uh, it's Michelle Obama, Barack Obama. Okay, yeah, so it's interesting because I, I decided that those might be the two most familiar um, contemporary art images that the public will have some literacy with, and they might have already seen them in the paper and, and all the celebrations of the unveiling of those portraits. So Barack Obama's portrait is done by Kehinde Wiley, and we're gonna come back to him, but I really wanted to focus on Michelle Obama's portrait for a minute because it signals a shift in kind of art after 1968 where the role of the reader is the viewer who's deciphering the image themselves because we're talking about visual literacy and reading visual texts. The role of the reader becomes significant because painters are sometimes inscribing signs and symbols in paintings that can be read, read in many different ways. Mm -hmm. So in this portrait of Michelle Obama, um, the portraitist Amy Sherald really wanted to represent her as being powerful, strong, intelligent, you know, purposeful, and, but at the same time, there's a sensitivity in the rendering of her in, in terms of the detailing. And when I looked at the image and I first saw the painting, what, what jumped out at me, and apparently it also jumped out at Amy Sherald because mm -hmm. this was in the news, was the inscription of a motif at the bottom of the dress that almost looks like um, little swatches of bricks being laid together in different colors. And when I saw that, it reminded me so much of the G's Bend quilts that were created in Alabama in the 20th century by this quilting collective. Of um, African-American women. Yeah, African-American mm -hmm. women. And then also Amy Sherald read into the, 
the dress itself. Mondrian, who's a Netherlandish um, painter from the early 20th century who moved into something called the style, which was moving into a, a palette that was primary colors, red, yellow, and blue, black and white, and sometimes gray. And he was really all about creating a sense of equilibrium on the canvas. It was pure abstraction, mm -hmm. but with this goal of kind of a utopian goal of equilibrium. So that's what Amy Sherald saw in the, in the work. And some people might just see the dress or some people might just recognize the dress as being a part of the designer Michelle Smith's collection from 2016. Mm -hmm. And that is where Mrs. Obama actually had seen the dress originally and where she decided to um, request an adaptation of it for her portrait. And, you know, and Michelle or Mrs. Obama chose that dress from any a number of dresses she could have chosen. So she had a part in you know deciding that. And I think that's really fascinating because you think of an artist as just gonna come up with something on their own and, and, and put it together. But there's there's a commission there's a there's a uh, there's a person who's being painted and then you know and then the artist themselves has their own entry that oh, that they want to put into the the piece um, i find that fascinating and, and the the portrait of barack obama it's the artist actually does that as well help the the um the person being painted has a say in exactly a way. exactly so, so Barack Obama, um, as his portraitist, he has Kahindi Wiley, who's a young, relatively young, um, contemporary African-American artist who was educated at Yale. And he started painting traditional, historical, Western portraits. Like, for example, think about Napoleon leading the charge over the Alps. But instead of actually locating that subject in the painting, what he would do is he'd go out to New York. He lived in New York City. And he would kind of street select somebody. He would find somebody on the streets of, let's say, Harlem, who was very interesting to him. And he would say, OK, would you be interested in being in one of my paintings? He would show the person examples of his work. He would invite the person into his studio. And then that individual would then go through art history books with Gehindi Wiley and decide how they wanted to have themselves represented and what kind of agency they wanted to have in the picture, what clothing, you know, what position, what pose. So the image that we have here on the screen is a Kehinde Wiley painting of Willem van Huythuysen, who happened to be a Dutch Baroque yarn merchant who was very, um, what you see is actually not this merchant, but we're, I'm talking about the original painting. So this one is based on a painting from the Dutch Baroque period painted by Franz Hals in 1625. And the central subject, it's a full length portrait like the one that you see, holding a sword against the ground and positioning himself in a little bit of a haughty gesture is a Dutch Baroque yarn merchant who's wearing all black with a big white ruff around his neck. So this individual that you see in this painting by Kehinde Wiley selected that historic that Franz Hall's painting mm -hmm. and the pose, but instead of in, imbibing all of it, he actually decided to wear his own clothes. So he's wearing street clothing by Sean John or P. Diddy, Puff Diddy, and then also Timberland shoes. So it brings these two periods kind of into conversation and creates a dialogue between these two traditions of traditional Western history painting and portraiture, and then contemporary American street culture. And actually, visit bringing rep visual representation also to subjects who are not in traditional Western history paintings. So it's, it's a very exciting shift that he's undertaking. And so Barack Obama, I think, recognized the excitement of that. And um, really, they're very grand and large scale, like six to eight feet mm -hmm. and over life size. And so Barack Obama ended up selecting Kennedy Wiley for his. Yeah, it's interesting. When I look at the example that you're showing us here, uh, my first impression was it seemed like a Hindi, an Indian type. I, I got that sense when I first saw it. And then I looked closer. Of course, I didn't have my glasses on at the moment I looked at it. And then I put my glasses on. I'm like, oh, there's some more things to see here. Um, the backdrops are also very colorful. And then there's actually some growth, outgrowths from some of the plants that you see that are kind of spiraling around the subject's legs. Where's the significance in there? Yeah, so that that's part of his procedure and practice is to take the central subject of the traditional traditional portrait and then to actually instead of putting it in like let's say a landscape or looking at Napoleon on his horse charging over the Alps what Candy Wiley does is he takes this pattern and decoration element and fills the background and he uses all different kinds of visual languages thinking again about visual literacy you can see like um, um, Islamic calligraphy, kind of the vines in Islamic calligraphy. You might see in this case Indian kind of tendrils 
and or lotus flowers that are also in this image that we have um, of William von Hothesen. And then he also kind of creates an, an overwhelming pattern that holds up to the, for, the figure itself. So instead of the background falling away and cre creating a deep space, it's almost as if he's bringing those two into equal weighting in the visual field. So you are supposed to pay a lot of attention to them and they are very kind of luxurious, you know, colorful, strong imagery. So. Yeah, it's beautiful. And the, the artists are really taking some chances. You know, they're, they're pushing up against how things are done. They're go, the, the Warhol was a genius at going into the abstract and, and doing something nobody else had done before and communicating in a different way. Um, do, do artists feel that they're constricted? I know there used to be this notion that, oh, this is the way you paint, and then this is the way, this is the way it's done. That's, this is how people are going to appreciate it because it has certain values. Um, but then you can get into really abstract things, and I think our next image is, is very jazzy. It's, it's kind of, it can either be something that will totally absorb you or you might just say, oh, that's not art. What, yeah. How do you feel about those? Okay, so the next image is by a contemporary um, Ethiopian-born artist named Julie Meritu. She was born in 1970, and she is painting a, a series of three paintings that she actually submitted to the Carnegie International Exhibition. I think it was the 45th or 54th, and this was one of three images called Stadia 1, 2, and 3. This is Stadia 3, so it's the third in the series. It's incredibly large, so it's probably I mean, probably bigger than this entire television set. And what she does is she kind of, it's a, the visual language when we talk about uh, visual literacy here is abstraction. But you see it as being very abstract from the, di from the distance, but what she does is create a, a painting for an activated reader. She wants you to see that abstraction from the distance and then come close to it and start identifying specific signs and symbols. And that's what we have done traditionally with images. Think about the altarpieces of the Greek amphora. You're looking for images, signs, and symbols that represent the culture. So some of those that are inscribed in this painting, in the very lower right-hand corner, she has um, the NBC logo of that peacock. It's a line drawing of the peacock. She also has flags that you might see on a car lot or at a, at a sporting event like a swim meet. Um, she, in the very background, she oftentimes places line drawings, almost like blueprints of architectural scapes, like let's say a coliseum or a stadium. And then on top of that, there's almost this swirling activity of visual gestural uh, marks that she creates that are almost improvisational, that have a very expressive quality to them that doesn't link necessarily to a sign or symbol. It's more the visual language of abstraction, which is different from traditional representations that have a didactic meaning. Mm -hmm. So it's exciting because she's working in the 21st century in a way that opens a space for the reader to be activated, to enter in, to actually look at the text and start trying to decipher what they see. And she says that she creates her paintings this way almost as a palimpsest, where a painting has many layers to be read because she wants it to communicate an in-betweenness, something that invites the reader in. You see one thing, you step back, you see it differently, you step in again, and it's that in-betweenness in these kind of large public spaces that she's capturing, like a stadium or a city um, square, mm -hmm. so. It's it's amazing. This is why I take a, an audio tour when I go to the art <laughs> museum, because there's so much to learn. There's so much depth to these paintings. Um, the connections that you've drawn here, the historical connections, the cultural connections, the reasons behind visual literacy that, that the average person probably doesn't pay a lot of attention to, um, t you know, taking the time out to really delve in and, and study some of this, it, it will pay off for the for the visual, for the reader, we'll say the reader yeah. in this case, yeah. And I think reading visual texts, you, you develop your fluency. And we're all bombarded every day now through Instagram, you know, the 24 hour media cycle, everything with so many images that in the past images served kind of a didactic um, purpose, which was to be used for teaching. Mm -hmm. Whereas today it's for all kinds of, it could be the representation of data analysis so that in, if you're on your phone and you look at something, it's a schematic diagram of, for example, the trajectory of some cultural change in the last 30 years. Images now are, are being presented to us so regularly that if you 
develop your fluency with visual literacy, it allows you, the more you, it's almost like using a foreign language. The more you use it, the more you start seeing, the more you understand. And so I, I'm a big proponent in people just taking the plunge and trying to understand things. And recently I was on a trip um, to London and I went on a tour at the Tate Modern. Mm -hmm. And there was a gentleman on my tour that the, the docent would say, what do you all see in this painting? And I think one of them was a Julie Moretto painting. And he was able to just riff as if it was, you know, a jazz improvisation on all the different layers of meaning that he saw in the painting and all the different readings that he had. And it was so exciting to be in that kind of an environment where somebody wasn't in an art history class or an art historian, but was, was able to just start seeing what they wanted to see and reading what they were able to read and, and making connections in the work. Yeah, so art can art is a vehicle for communication. It can, it can also be sending out some humor. It, it can be parody. There are, there, are, there are different ways to interpret it. And as you become more fluent in reading these images, then that's, that's going to give you that much more of an experience. Yeah, and it's even like my students have been teaching me recently about memes. You know, it's an image that's <laughs> represented and kind of made ironic or right. hu humor's been overlaid I, I, on top I, of it. I, I envision the, the boyfriend looking back at the girlfriend, that, that meme. <laughs> <laughs> and you can put any kind of uh, text to, to correspond to it. It can always mean something different. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So it's, it's interesting because we look at something like Andy Warhol and we can read altarpieces backwards through it. And that's the same way when we see text, the more you see them, the more you see other things in them. Yeah. Yeah, fascinating. So how can people learn more? What, are, what would you recommend to um, our community in, in getting more engaged with art? Okay, well the best thing is that the Washington museums are mainly free and open and accessible. So I have a museum project for my students where they go and pick an object that's important to them. They have, it's an open field anywhere between the Renaissance and the present and they just connect to it in any way and then they, that's where they start their research. I think that's a great strategy to just go and see what interests you because that in and of itself tells you something about your orientation towards visual language. Mm -hmm. um, another thing to do is to go on docent-led tours because it's really exciting if you feel like you don't have those tools for reading things like scale, color, texture, um, line, composition. Sometimes going on a docent-led tour will help lead your eye to recognizing some of these signs and symbols that you might not be familiar with but are not inaccessible. Right. So, yeah. I always, I always love the docent-led tours, yeah. yeah. I do too, I do too. <laughs> it's yeah. the best way to do it. Um, thank you so much for being on the program with us, Dr. McGuire. It's, it's been an education. I think our audience has learned a lot. And um, I'm definitely gonna go to the portrait gallery and check out some of the images that we've seen today. If they're still available out there at the National Portrait Gallery. And or look at them online, and you know you can Google any one of these to take yeah. a closer look. And also, the Virginia Museum is having the Awaken show. It just opened. Okay. So if anybody, you could check their website, the VMFA website, and if it's still up, it's a fantastic show. Okay, very so, good. Yeah. Well, thank you again. Thank you. And thank you for watching On the Go with AAUW.